Hey guys, if you haven't already, make sure to check out the North American Railways Discord page, link down below. And make sure to also check out my latest scenario, The Return of the Giants. The link is also in the description down below. Hey guys, Shadow Seal here, and welcome back to another episode of Railwork Sundays. Um, it's been a while since I've really done an actual episode, like a brand new one. And don't worry, those remasters are coming about soon now that we've kind of finished up the Sherman Hill saga. But I've decided that we're going to really do one last scenario for the Union Pacific. That is a guided tour of Promontory Summit, as this description reads. Additional DLC required, UP-119. On this run along the UPRR route from Corny to Promontory, skirting the east side of the Great Salt Lake, we'll point out landmarks along the way and explain some of the history of the line. Okay. Alright, so, like I, I, you probably noticed, I've already gotten into the game, so... Now, this is the only message box I'll read. We begin our tour at Cornage, some 28 miles east of Promontory. Now, I'm sure, sorry if the camera's shaking, but now that we have this going, I am going to go ahead, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to pretty much get the locomotive ready, and I'll be right back. Corny is located in southeastern Box Elder County, on the west side of the Bear River. It was founded in the spring of 1869, named by one of the founders, General J.A. Williamson, for his 14-year-old daughter. Corny was designed to be a freight transfer point for the shipment of goods and supplies to the mining towns of western Montana, as well as the communities of Idaho and northern Utah, along the Montana Trail. Corny is known by many names, including the Berg on the Bear, the City of the Ungodly, the Genteel City, and others. Its history is quite unique from the other pioneer communities because it was settled by people of different religions, and those who profess no religious affiliation at all, rather than by members of the Latter-day Saints or the Mormon faith. The founders could see Corny as the state capital of Utah, as it was the shipping center for the Union Pacific Railroad. However, with the building commencing, August of 1871 of the three foot gauge Utah Northern Railroad northward from the UP line at Ogden, Corny's hopes and dreams were shattered and the city dwindled fast as a freighting center. Nonetheless, it was still a busy station until the building of the luncheon cutoff across the Great Salt Lake in 1904 and 1905. Alright, it's time to go, or at least get ready to go. So let's sound the whistle. I know that. Okay, so hopefully that triggered it because the message box must have probably messed me up there. But we are on our way. Okay, good. We are clear to proceed. Open up the throttle. And we're off. So, I hope you guys enjoyed that little video segment. Uh, I actually went ahead and made that simply because the first couple of text boxes that explained the area were god-awful for me to really uh, read right off the top of my head. So I had to actually take a screenshot of each text box 
and then write down a script on my computer, print it out, voice them through a separate program, then capture the video through another scenario that I made, basically just saying, like, these are the scenes of this, and so on and so forth. And I'm planning to do that for all these kind of tour videos, essentially. So we don't really have to deal with too much, per se. And also, I know I'm looking down, but looking at the locomotive, making sure that we depart on schedule and depart safely. Uh, go ahead and just plop myself into the rear car here. Okay, here we go. I set myself down, and we're going to go. Already at 6 miles an hour. I'll probably open up the throttle a little bit. Whistle didn't sound good. Three blasts. I am not good with this quilling thing so far. Whoopsie. That is not what I wanted. Oh well. Alright, so we're clearing out of the junction. Flip those around. That way trains can go through. Here we go. I'm going to open her up and let's get her running. She's a runner. All right. Well, with that taken care of, uh, yeah. So, this is Promontory Summit from Smokebox. And yes, I said Smokebox. The guy who's made the 119, the 844, the Jupiter, the Buffalo, and the Consolidation. All of which, or most of which, we've all played. I think the only locomotive I have not played on Railwork Sundays or on Trackside as of yet are the the um, 844, or the FEF3 as it's classified as, and the Buffalo. But actually the next guided tour scenario is with the Buffalo, and I do plan to do a special video for number 844. So you got that. So, But we have seen most of them already in a video or two. So, it's not that, it won't be that hard for us to, you know, like, it, basically he's known for locomotive DLC. And, uh, American locomotive DLC. I might, I, the reason I say American locomotive DLC is because he's a Brit. Or, rather, he's from the UK, essentially. You would think that an Amer, like, something like this, like American DLC, uh, irrigation and fall, da, 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 we don't really need to t read that too much. Basically, just saying that irrigation is to like change the landscape here. But Smokebox, he's from the UK, which would not be very apparent if you looked at his list of DLCs he's released, all of which have been American Steam. Now I don't know the reasoning behind that, but I've always been curious at, about it myself, per se. Like why he's so I, I guess American Steam can be fascinating outside the United States, but when you're like me and you've seen it firsthand, seen it in action, especially when you've seen the actual locomotive, one of his locomotives that he's actually created firsthand, it becomes kind of this like, well, what is it exactly? What, what are like, like what is so special about it to them that they are willing to go to great length to model it? And I think I figured out the answer. We're Giants, we we make such big locomotive and such big locomotives and cars and whatnot that most other countries don't typically do. Um, a locomotive like the 119 here. Yeah, let's talk about the bridges. A locomotive like the 119 here. She honestly is not very rare outside the United States. The 440 wheel arrangement, though typically referred to as the American wheel arrangement, is actually a very common wheel arrangement on other European countries, especially with express locomotives. However, we use the 440s as general service locomotives. We did have them as passenger service locomotives for a while, but as trains got bigger, the 440s were more branch line locomotives. And here's the thing. Wheel arrangements like the 484, 
and the 482, which were very well known here in the States, they are almost non-existent outside the States. There's only a handful of countries that operate 482s and 484s, at least I think. Most of, almost all the European nations do not operate the 482 and the 484s. I know South Africa and a few African railways operate the larger locomotives. Yeah, this is this is telling us about the boiler pressure. But as a whole, most of the locomotives you tend to see are of smaller wheel ranges, and that's for a good reason. Europe, because it was the first place to receive steam locomotives and everything, and they're the oldest, like, we are less than two, less than 300 years old as a nation. We were founded in 1776. Railroads became a, th and a lot of European countries had been around since ancient Rome. So they had a lot of history already. We did not. So we had the freedom, as you can see by the land around us, to really build outward and build bigger and better, bigger and larger locomotives, faster locomotives. I mean, the Union Pacific A44 is designed to go 80 miles an hour. 80 to 100 miles an hour uh, with her 80 inch diameter drivers. I mean, these things are massive when you see them up close. But on the same at the same time, the only reason we built these large steam locomotives and everything like that, like these large and powerful locomotives, is ironically for the very reason we have this large open land surrounding us. We didn't have really anything already pre-existing, like ancient castles. We didn't have castles. We didn't have um, giant like towns and cities all crowded around in the small space of things. I mean, England, though, seems like a lot of cities and towns in the area. There's plenty of like open land as well, but not as much as the United States. I mean, from what I've heard, the only other country that kind of, like, is close to us in terms of the open land, like the open, wide open spaces of the frontier, is Russia. In fact, Russia is, I believe, twice the size of the United States. And they're the only other nation other than the United States and Canada. Don't, I don't want to forget them. Basically, North America. They're the only other nation other... And the only other country, the, you know, that whole thing, that, for the most part, is capable of lo running long, heavy trains. And they kind of need to do that. We need to operate long and heavy trains because we just have such a massive dis, such a massive distance between each city. I mean, where I live, it's a ten-minute drive to get to the nearest town. But, um, that is the closest town. The next closest town, I believe, would be about, oh, a um, couple hours, maybe? I almost want to say it's like two or three hours. I know St. Louis to Chicago, via car, is, I think, I want to say six hours by driving, and two hours by train, at least two hours by train. Pretty long distance if you think about it. Now, the closest couple of towns in, you know, say, uh, Europe, and granted, they have higher speeds than us, uh, that would be probably about an hour to th maybe 30 minutes by train, depending on, like, where you're wanting to go. And then by truck or car, it's probably going to take you, for traffic reasons, maybe a couple hours. I mean, that's kind of a given. Like, the towns and cities in Europe are much more closer together than we are, like, where, than what we are in the United States. I mean, Wyoming and Utah, ironically, these two states, Wyoming and Utah, they have some of the largest, like, the least... I think Wyoming was actually named the least populated state in the least populated state in the United States. I mean, the population of Wyoming is actually very small, even though eight hundred thousand people came to see came to Cheyenne. 
to see the, the C4014. I mean, I'm sure that when the 4014 started to operate, Wyoming's population probably doubled that day. Or maybe Cheyenne. I wouldn't say Wyoming, but you know what I mean. So, and the, I mean, it's just one of those things. I mean, for us, and, and there's a lot of, a lot, a lot of, a lot more differences between us and Europe as well, in terms of like how we manage the railroads and how we operate them. For example, uh, in the United States, if you go above 80 miles an hour, trains are required to have in-cab signaling and that is a big problem because a lot of railroads though can probably facilitate high speeds like 80 miles an hour or higher the cost of retrofitting a lot of locomotives to have in-cab signaling like that they do on the northeast corridor and other high-speed corridors in the world would be too costly now, interestingly enough, I saw this photo uh, in a group I'm in, uh, the, and it showed they, that um, the 4014 actually was given in-cab signaling, which the 844 also has, and so does her sister, 3985. Now, the reason they have in-cab signaling is pretty obvious. You can't really see out the front window like this of any steam locomotive. It's very difficult. Most of the time, they will lean their heads out the windows to actively see uh, like where the next signal is coming from, like what the next signal indication is. That's actually one of the reasons why when you watch videos of like steam operations in the United States, you'll often hear the hear either the engineer or the fireman shout, Claire, and then the other one shouts back the same phrase as basically acknowledging they're clear. That is because they're keeping an eye out for the signals, and if one can see the signal, they will have to announce it to the other crew member and basically tell them, you're clear to proceed, you can keep going, just make sure you acknowledge that it's the clear signal. And that's why a lot of steam locomotives have in-cab signaling. Oh, hello. We're passing over Sulphur Creek. Ahead to our right is the Little Mountain. Yep. Little Mountain, huh? But yeah... I mean, the in-cab signaling on steam locomotives is pretty obvious. However, when you go into a diesel locomotive, very few of them are equipped with in-cab signaling, I feel. Now, older generation diesels will often have some sort of in-cab signaling for certain corridors. And a lot of locomotives will have an ATS system or an automatic train system uh, in place to make sure the crew is aware and awake of their whole operation. But in short, these the in-cab signaling that's required for long, fast running of over 80 miles an hour is so strenuous that a lot of railroads refuse to kind of update their equipment to... Uh, it's a bit expensive, essentially. But as time goes on, other cities and towns, like there's a new rail, there's a rail line in Michigan. Uh, one of the Amtrak corridors that they operate. They have started to update the line to operate trains over 100 miles an hour. Why is this significant? Well, it's not a, the line is not electrified. So, Stinky Springs is to our right. Stinky. So, essentially, uh, railroading, like, like the, this Michigan line, the Michigan line, as I think it's called, essentially, they're doing testing right now, and they're pretty much ready to go with 100-mile-an-hour trains. But the fact that it's not electrified is a very significant thing. Because electrified trains on the Northeast Corridor are typically operated at 100 miles an hour plus. The main reason being is that that track is geared for that. That basically is a... That track was built for, you know, operation... Like, rebuilt for higher speeds. I, I will give, and you know, now, of course, the Northeast Corridor has become famous over the years for a lot of its high-speed services, uh, as well as a few disastrous wrecks, I might add, but it was also one of those, like, particular operations, I feel like. The Northeast Corridor itself is a very interesting rail line in that it's the only electrified railroad, rail section of railroad tracks 
in the United States. The Northeast Corridor is the only electrified main line. The only other main, the only other railroad that's electrified is, I believe, something called the Black Mesa, Powell River and Black Mesa Railroad, which operates the E60 locomotives. They still operate there over. Uh, we, and this is really interesting because we, I'm sure a lot of you, when I immediately said Black Mesa, you're thinking of Half Life, which is the Black Mesa facility. Well, interestingly enough, the area Half Life is set in is essentially that area. They're in Black kind of that Black Mesa area. So, you got that going for you. But they're the, there's only two electrified main lines. Now, um, I've done runs on electrified trackage before that were around for a long time. I mean, the last, my first ever trackside video featured me going over the, uh, the transcontinental, like the the Milwaukee Road's Transcon line, the Avery and Drexel line. Oh, hello. Oh, yeah, that's that one's going to get some narration to it. That's fine. Now I was just talking about the birds. The birds! But, yeah, it's, uh, but... Now, granted, the only reason we don't operate electric locomotives long distances anymore, like we used to, yeah, I mean... Up until the 1930s and 40s, electrified main lines were pretty much uh, the norm in some places. Uh, a lot of railroads up north actually operated the electrified lines. The Great Northern, the Milwaukee Road, both had electrified transcon lines. And the Northeast Corridor, the Pennsylvania Railroad had a bunch of electrified lines. Um, down in California, you had a few electrified lines operating. It's just, they were all over the place at one time. But when it became, like, it, the thing was that as diesel came into fray, and a lot of these locomotives could basically travel at high speeds without really, like, like electric locomotives, I feel, were very interesting in that up until the 19... Like, we didn't really focus on electric locomotives because it was just so much of a distance thing. It was so costly to build or maintain an electrified main line, which is one of the reasons why the Northeast Corridor is the only surviving electrified main line in the United States, really. It was just a matter of cost and a matter of... That's one of the reasons why uh, both uh, Stevens Pass, which was actually the which actually was electrified at one point, and the Avery and Drexel route, which was eventually just abandoned altogether. Uh, today, I think it's a bike, uh, a road path or something like that. Um, she, th Those two routes were, de they had their cantries removed simply because it was cheaper to run diesels. Now, ironically, this was interesting because when, they, when the Milwaukee road swapped the, like remove their electrified cantonaries. It was right before the oil crisis of 1970s of the 1970s. So yeah, you can figure out what that happened. They basically fucked themselves over when they removed their electrified electrified main line, and they were shit out of luck. This really hit them hard because I think a few de like less than a decade later they would be absorbed by the Sioux line which was one of their main competitors in the area. And as a result, uh, and this is actually interesting too, because the Sioux line was eventually absorbed by Canadian Pacific. So now Milwaukee Road, all the Milwaukee Road systems, uh, and these, like, Milwaukee Road 261 is technically uh, a Canadian Pacific locomotive now because the the... The railroad is essentially owned by Canadian Pacific. Now, this also means that trackage, that the Milwaukee Road actually came to St. Louis, too. Not to, like, a very long extent, but they were out here at some point. But, oh, shit, I didn't even realize I was using that much boil, using that much pressure. Okay. Hold on, buddy. Um... I didn't see that I was I, my boiler pressure dropped so drastically. I'm now at 103 p 104 psi. Okay, sorry about that, sir. 
But uh, yeah, it was one of those things that the, because of the Milwaukee Road and a few other railroads actually managed to make it to St. Louis down here, that means that technically Canadian Pacific and Canadian National, I'll talk about those guys as, as well, both those railroads have trackage rights into St. Louis. Which is insane because they're, when you think of these two Canadian railroads, the Canadian Pacific and the Canadian National, you don't typically see them coming any farther down south than, say, Michigan or, uh, like, you know, the very fringe north states. But no, they actually have trackage rights as far down south as the Missouri, uh, Chicago, like, Illinois, uh, Ohio, Indiana. Like, they have trackage rights down, down to, like, the middle of the nation, essentially. And the reason for that is the is basically they be, they slowly absorbed some American railroads that operated in Canada. The Milwaukee Road, the Sioux Line, uh, even the Illinois Central Railroad operated to some extent near Canadian trackage. I mean, uh, the Bessemer Lake Erie actually had trains that would cross the Great Lakes into Canada and would share trackage with the Canadian National. That's why the Bessemer Lake Erie as a whole, actually still technically operates as part of the, still technically operates with the Canadian National. In fact, uh, I think it was up until 2015, I think, where some diesel locomotives for the old Besner Lake Erie were still in their Besner Lake Erie paints. The only difference was that they were simply like the patch for the Besner Lake Erie logo was either painted over or just blacked out altogether. And they still had their paint of the Bedmer and Lake Erie, but they just didn't say it. And that's actually very cool to me, that a lot of these old railroads from like the 19... like as far back as the 1900s were still operating to some extent. But the Union Pacific, it hurt themselves. They were probably one of the most successful railroads in America and they've really earned the reputation of the so-called building America. I mean, they literally have earned that whole reputation, that whole like, that whole motto saying building America that's plastered on the side of their locomotives. Which is, which granted is very good. I mean, they, they essentially, like I said before in several other videos, they they created what America is today as an industrial giant. If it wasn't for the Transcontinental Railroad, the Promontory Sun and Promontory Summit, and everything like this, we wouldn't be here today. We wouldn't be in the situation where the railroads themselves were more or less just a big deal. Like we. If it wasn't for these railroads, these rail, these titans of industry, essentially, we honestly might have struggled. Thatcher's Mountain is to our north, over to the right there. Again, and this, it's just, I'm, I'm extremely, I was extremely excited for the whole, like, promontory, the Ogden celebration, the Transcon celebration, everything like that. It was an incredible event. From what I've seen, what I've heard, all this stuff. Everybody in the rail industry was getting involved. I mean, everybody. There were, like... Every, I mean, Steamtown got involved, to some extent. They posted a picture on their Facebook page, I believe. Or posted a picture saying, so close. And it was of their big boy, number 4002, I think. Uh, and their Nickel Plate Road Berkshire, number 759. And they were kind of nose to nose. They were going to, like, they were trying to recreate their version of the Promontory Summit celebration. And they missed it by that much. They kind of posted that image, I think, like a few days after the initial celebration occurred. So, it was one of those little situations. But, I got to admit... To know that, like, to see what these guys had to do in five years, in six years, essentially. The rail, the Pacific Railroad Act started in 
1864. 1869 was when the railroad was finally completed. Five years, but most people would assume six, but you could kind of stretch this out to six because a few months had to go by as they, you know, tried to meet up. Because they were kind of going all over the place here. Now, oh, shit. God damn it. Get off there. Now, interestingly enough, uh, Promontory Summit, like, railroading in the United States was not kind to the way everyone operated. Like, the way things operated on these rails, they were not very good. They were not the best. So, it was a dangerous job, a dangerous game to, pl to, dr to operate a steam locomotive, to run a railroad. I mean, this was, uh, this was one hell of a job, uh, and I, I, I just, <laughs> I gotta do that, though. Okay, we're coming up to that section there. How, how far is the promise, uh, uh, Blue Creek here? Five miles, okay. We're not doing too bad. I'm gonna set the switches to enter the yard here. What's that? No, they're not. Okay. We just stop there. Oh, hello. So, like I said, we're going to try and do an end-to-end -end run here. But, once we reach Blue Creek, I'm going to pause the video. We're going to take a bit of a break. And from there, that's when we kind of continue on to Promontory. Which is way over here. Keep in mind, Promontory is 28 miles from our starting destination. We're now 14 miles away. We're halfway there. But there's a hell of a climb in the next part, and once we start going towards it, it's going to be one hell of a run. I'm double-checking my scene, and everything's good. Making sure we keep water in the boiler here. The one thing I will admit is that this, this locomotive, I've sort of figured out how to operate her in a more reliable sense. You've obviously seen me... Running this locomotive with very little effort on my part. I'm not even focusing to some extent on her anymore. Like maintaining speed and everything. Because she is such an... Uh, like as you start to real, really figure out the mechanics of her. Really figure out how she operates. How she runs. Like get, get that whole thing going. You suddenly realize just how easy it is to operate some of these locomotives. Because these locomotives, like, at least in this game, in Railworks, operating steam locomotives, depending on the model, you've got your work cut out for you. But for like the 119, we, I was lucky. With the 119, I'm lucky that we got the locomotive operating as well as we did. Like, she can actually become quite difficult to maintain, kind of operate. I mean, we're going to be going down, like... There's actually a particularly interesting run I was trying to do earlier today. Just climbing the 2.2% grade to Promontory. Which is, you know, the climb I was talking about. But, here's the thing. The 2.2% climb up to Promontory with a 14 car train. Is no easy feat for one small 440. So, we'll see how that goes, honestly. I'll probably do a special little video for that, where I will kind of, like, show it off as a how-to-drive kind of video. But, op like, this locomotive is, like, the the 119 and her sisters, they're diff... They, they could be tricky to drive, but Lord have mercy when you try and go up a certain gradient. That's actually... Wow, we were only recording for 35 minutes as we approach here. That's interesting. I thought we were going to have a lot farther to get, like a lot longer to go. Where are we exactly? Oh, we're here. Okay, so we might take it about 50 minutes maybe if we keep maintain speeding, maintain our speed and whatnot. I don't know. But yeah, she's a, yeah, she's a, she's an interesting loco. Now I'm sure by the, this time, by the time this video comes out, 
I will be pretty much working on quite a few other projects that it, including a series of trackside videos kind of detailing how to operate a steam locomotive in particular the 7MT the 7MT as well as a few others but as it stands right now we've got a lot on our plate and it's not really come we're not you know we're not done yet now this week's this coming track side is going to be an interesting one because that was actually originally part of Railwork Sundays. Okay. We're he we're now heading northwards towards Blue Creek, uh, Blue Creek Valley towards the town of Blue Creek, the at the foot of the Promontory Mountains. Basically, we're nearing Promontory. Basically, we're now approaching Blue Creek. We can probably now get ready to operate or uh, see. Let's see here. Yeah, we're at three miles out. Three and a quarter, I think. Yeah. Now. Hmm, how's our water doing? 81%. We might be able to, with, uh, you know, keep water out, or keep water in the boiler for a while. How, many, how much water have I used in the, th the boiler? Eh, seems okay. So, here we are. So we're, cu we're coming around this curve here, and then we go around another curve later on and enter Blue Creek. That's where we get kind of tricky. Whoo, boy. A lot of this is being cut, so this is a fairly short episode, honestly. God damn. Oh, boy. <laughs> I gotta admit, though, this, these video, the, the, the Railwork Sunday, like, all this stuff I've been working on as of late, it's been very interesting to see it all play out, all slowly coming together, because, as a whole, my channel has really changed over the years, like, as it stands, I have not once really done too much of a focus of, you know, just focusing on one thing or another. Okay, we're going upgrade now. I'll open up the throttle a little bit here. Okay. Looks like we won't be able to really sustain the train with the water we have in the boiler. I'm going to have to start entering water in the boiler here. be doing okay now got a mile to go a mile and a half really and it's off the you yeah, you'll be two miles out of, less than a mile out actually because the first one's like yeah what well, yeah that would be a less than a mile out yeesh I've been starting to get a regular routine again so this will be the first video in an active week of video so sit tight with that I mean, a very, like, an actual week of videos. Now, um, the first video is, of course, this episode of Railwork Sundays. But the very next video you might see is not from Re my channel, Virtual Railfire Productions, but instead from my secondary channel, The Otaku Gamer. If you haven't checked that out, go ahead and check it out on the corner here, uh, somewhere on the screen here. But, um... Yeah, the Otaku Gamer, I'm starting to push for some sort of subscribers on that channel. And I'm actually going to be commissioning artwork and stuff for that channel. The channel logo is something I made a while back. Uh, the intro logos that you've been seeing as of late, the whole like Shadow Steel, eight, Shadow Steel Network, that was from a buddy of mine. He, I gotta give him credit. Um, check out his channel because he's done. he's doing a lot of like... Uh, Euro Truck Simulator stuff, and he's kind of suggested to me to work on that kind of stuff too. Kind of doing trucking videos and kind of expand that. And to be honest, I'm taking his word on that. Uh, the next couple of retro plays will be kind of older trucking video trucking games as we kind of move up to kind of uh, uh, like, you know, games that I've really enjoyed. Okay, we're at point eight. Yeah, as we approach Blue Creek here, we should be good. 
Yeah, we're we're not doing too bad. Forty five minutes, huh? Forty five minutes, a lot of that being cut. Oh boy. Uh, I really hope the video that I've done, like the intro, I totally forgot what I did for the intro, but oh well. We're just getting right into the meat and potatoes of this thing. There's going to be a lot of editing too now that I think about it. A lot of stuff going on. Okay, we're approaching. There's the destination. We've got, we've pretty much lost steam pressure here. So I'm going to pop, you know, pop open the reverse for now. Make sure we can get some more steam up. We kind of get faster up here, up this hill, so. So we're less than a mile out. And as the lag sets in, as the town starts to load. So this is one particular interesting issue I've been having with Railworks as of late. The town of Blue Creek, as well as any other like major settlement, when it loads up initially, it actually just freezes the game for a short period of time. And then just pops it in. So that's interesting. Probably do. I probably can close the valves now. Oh wait, never mind. All right. All right. How far? All right. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to start closing the valve, closing the steam pressure, here, like closing the regulator here, as we slowly enter the town of Blue Creek. Because we're now on a level gradient, or rather, mostly level. And we're probably, we're going to need to slow down to about 10 miles an hour as we enter the junction here. Oh, I wonder if my mouse cursor is showing up. Is it? No, it's not. Okay. So I've turned off the mouse cursor. That's interesting. We're coming up on the town of Blue Creek. Pull into the passing siding. And fill up the turner with water. At the water tower. Da, 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 and yeah. All right. And pretty much... Shut her down here. All right, here's something I forgot. I haven't probably showed this off the entire time. We gotta blow down a little bit. There you go. Blow down is complete. Uh, kind of really pick up speed here because we're slowing down a little bit too much. We're at 12 miles an hour. How are we doing water wise? 74? Okay. Kind of keep her steady here. Boy is, um, see, oh boy. <laughs> yep, I'm going to slow down now. So the, the position of each of these signals is basically signaling, telling us where... Like, where to maintain our speed here. So, we're now at 10 miles an hour as we enter the yard here. Start sounding the bell. That, now, um, I totally forgot. I, did, I think I've mentioned this before. But that bell and the whistle on this locomotive are not, are not exactly, they're... They're from a 440. They're from an actual American. 
1860s 440, or rather a replica of it, the Leviathan. Now, if you don't know about this, there was a replica of the Leviathan, I think built a couple of years ago now. And the Leviathan, as it stands, like as it turns out, uh, was built for the purpose of just being a replica of the Leviathan. The, this was from a company that had made another 440 replica of the 1860s design earlier, uh, the number 17 York for Steam Into History. Well, one of the guys thought, well, why don't we just build another, why don't I get myself one to take around the country? Leviathan was his first choice. Now, if you're like confused and like, what, what's the Leviathan? Well, it's rather ironic you talk about the Leviathan. It's rather ironic you ask something like that, if you do. But it just so happens the Leviathan is the Jupiter sister. The Leviathan is number Central Pacific Railroad number 63. The Jupiter is locomotive number 60. The Leviathan was one of the locomotives that was operated by the Central Pacific. Okay, we've passed the point where we should be actually stopping here. Whoops, that's not what I wanted. Okay, oh, it's kind of gear set up here. I just need to stop here. Stop, damn it! I miss it again, huh? All right, well. Well, that's not what I want, shit. All right. So, in part two of this scenario, we are going to go ahead and, well, climb up the 2.2% grade of Promontory Summit. So, sit tight. Boy, this is going to be a nightmare. If you like this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up and feel free to subscribe. Also, why not check out some of my other videos? I'm sure there might be something there you like. Maybe.